um, is I'm going to talk a little bit about what web mapping is, talk a little bit about OpenStreetMap, and then hopefully we can kind of jump between three different platforms, um, all of which are free, um, all of which kind of present a different kind of style of web mapping, none of which involve any sort of coding. So this is not going to be an introduction to coding, but instead this is an introduction to kind of web mapping. So with that said, there is a kind of difference between digital and web mapping. So when you think of digital, you may kind of think it's the same, same thing as web mapping, but it isn't in the context of GIS. So digital means it involves a computer. So this could be a desktop platform, something like ArcGIS, QGIS, that is not dependent upon the internet to complete a project, whereas web mapping is, right? So you're working in a web browser. Um, the end goal typically is to embed whatever you're producing into a website. Um, so something like Maps, Google Maps, something like OpenStreetMap are really kind of common different web mapping tools. Um, and they are connected, but they're different from mobile devices, so they're sort of a different genre of stuff that kind of deals more with your cell phone. And then it's also different from the digital globe type stuff, which is Google Earth. Um, and so when you think of web mapping, um, it's so commonplace today, right, but it does have a history. It sort of emerges, it emerges particularly out of Google Maps. Maps. So there was MapQuest, if anyone remembers that, and then Google Maps in the mid-2000s kind of came around and really sort of revolutionized the process of hosting and displaying uh, digital web maps. Um, and so there's now countless platforms. If you do a, a search for digital maps, you will be met with endless op options, some paid, some free. Um, and so you can kind of explore that and find what works for you. But OpenStreetMap is a really important place to begin, partially because when you get into actual map production, OpenStreetMap is a really common base map. And so it's important to have a little bit of background knowledge about what OpenStreetMap is. So you may have heard it, heard it referred to as the Wikipedia of maps. So it can be edited by anyone. It's licensed under an open license. It's designed to be a kind of community uh, mapping production that anyone can kind of go in, create an account, and then start adding the unique geographical information that you may have. So if you um, are really familiar with certain places, you may be most effective at adding that content to the map. And so there's kind of two primary ways that you can edit stuff on OpenStreetMap. There's a web editor, and then there's more, there's a more advanced editor. So that would only be if you really got, get into editing OpenStreetMap. Um, but if you're just kind of a casual user, kind of a casual explorer, the web editor feature is really nice for being able to make changes to the map. So just as an example, this is what it looks like. So you can see my account information up there. And so when you log in, you're presented with these kind of options here at the top. You can select edit. You then will have to zoom in pretty close for it to actually work effectively, right? Because it's designed for you to um, be able to change select data. So you can't be zoomed far out because then you wouldn't be able to see the specific um, details. So this is just zoomed in over Lexington. And then if we continue to zoom in, we can find our way to roughly where we are right now in the science. And as you can see, right, as you begin to zoom in, the features start to appear. So these would be the things you would be then editing. So for example, if you see a street name that's incorrect, maybe it's changed, God knows in Lexington roads randomly change names, you may, right, that's localized knowledge that you possess that you could then go in and add to the map. So if you continue to zoom in here, so we're at Rose Street, Here's Library Drive. Here's the Chem Physics Building. And then if we zoom up a little bit, we see Science Library. It is not Science and Engineering Library. Folks in this room, right, know that that should be changed. Um, and then you can also begin to see certain features displayed, right? Subway makes it onto the map. Um, subway and then you can see certain features right that are illustrating amenities that are located around the building so that the park benches are acknowledged there's a trash can um, all these types of things right are being put on put on the map by individuals that um, are interested in kind of updating and keeping up to date this information so theoretically right if you 
wanted to, you could click, and is it even known as the Margaret King Science Library, or is it just the Science and Engineering Library? And then it's the Science and so they're, they're split, right? Because it's like the Margaret, yeah. So if we click on this, see that it's being difficult. Oops, there we go. So right, you can see the kind of content that's provided here to the side, right? So it's providing an address, it's providing a name, um, and this type of information. So if anyone is interested, you can create your own account and correct. Um, the, the naming of the building. Um, and so you also then right have all the different features. And so the points up here is where you can access the unique features depending on what it is. Um, so you can trace the area of a building, you can draw lines through a street. If you do a point, um, you know, theoretically, if we knew something was here, right, you can then see that you're given all these points here to the side um, and you can search. So um, there's a lot of different points for a lot of different things, right, to try to be as specific as possible for what that amenity or that, what that location is, um, right, there's a difference between a restaurant and a coffee shop and wanting to be able to differentiate that on the map. And so once you make your edits, it can take up, upwards to 24 hours for it to actually reflect on the official open street map, but it does, right, so then it's like you're an active user, an active contributor, to a map that is then used by others, right? So it's a pretty interesting way to kind of be a com community mapper. And so when you go to click save, you're asked to kind of provide details for what changes you made just so it can kind of be verified um, as a way to kind of cut down on any sort of vandalism or mistakes being put into the map. Let's see here, so you can kind of see that I provide the uh, PowerPoint overviews too. Um, it is important to note though, right, that this is not a perfect endeavor. So one of the critiques of OpenStreetMap historically has been it's been very white male centrist, centrist perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, so for example, in the early 2011, 2012, there were critiques made that there were a million options for different types of bars. Is it a pub? Is it a bar? Is it a strip club? Is it a brothel? But then there were only two options for childcare one of which was kindergarten and the other was a safe haven. So as you can imagine, um, there's been a lot of pushback against that type of um, oversight. So those, um, that has been um, corrected, but you might find other things like that, right? As you sort of explore it, that it tends to sort of be privileging a certain perspective, certain information hasn't quite made its way as a feature. So you can suggest features and there is a voting process. So if you're interested in, in joining OpenStreetMap, you become a voting member. So people can put up proposals and say, well, you know, between uh, kindergarten and safe haven, maybe we should have something else. Here's my proposal. Um, and then it can be voted and either voted down or voted into the OpenStreetMap framework. So again, you know, it's kind of a um, evolving process, right? And it kind of requires people to be diligent and requires people to actually think critically about what this type of map should be representing, particularly as it becomes so commonplace, right? That you see OpenStreetMap being used increasingly um, in some contexts, perhaps more so than Google. So it's important, right, to be thinking about how do we actually make this as representative as possible. And then in terms of kind of ways to become involved with some of the different OpenStreetMap map features, some of you may have heard about it talked, in the con talked about in the context of humanitarian work, right, if there's some sort of natural disaster. OpenStreetMap has been pretty useful in terms of um, getting up-to-date information um, that can be kind of constantly updated. So they actually have a task manager website that you can go to and they list uh, kind of in a ranked priority different, um, different things that need to be addressed in relationship to humanitarian issues. So you can see the flooding in Peru kind of as a top priority right now. So you can kind of explore this stuff and see theoretically if you can kind of help add information onto the map. And then the other feature that is somewhat popular is just um, what's called map roulette. So it's basically a game 
Um, and so again, you can kind of go in and change things that need to be changed. Um, it typically will list certain mistakes that have been found. Um, and then you can kind of go in and make the appropriate edits. Maybe. Will it exist? Um, so that's just kind of an overview of OpenStreetMap. It kind of is one of the building blocks to kind of contemporary web mapping. It's an important website to kind of be familiar with, even if you don't become an active member of it. Right, and so again, as I mentioned, once you start getting into web mapping at a certain point, you're going to have to embrace coding. Um, in the context of web mapping, the, the kind of open source JavaScript program leaflet is, is one of the most popular. Um, it's a little more straightforward than some other kind of programs. And so if you follow um, the link to their website, you can see that they provide like a pretty nice tutorial for sort of getting involved. Right, they're all about simplicity, performance, and usability. How could it be bad? Um, so you can explore this. I put it up here not really to spend much time, but just kind of direct folks, particularly folks who kind of have a pre-existing background in coding, you might want to explore the kind of features of Leaflet. Um, but for our context, right, I wanted to kind of allow us to kind of get our hands dirty more quickly. And so the first program I actually want us to spend some time looking at is Social Explorer. So some of you may be familiar with this. It's a, it's a, data, it's a platform that the library has purchased a subscription to. So it typically costs money, but because we're affiliated with UK, we can all access the features for free. So if you just search for Social Explorer in your search engine on your computer, it should pop up. And then when you click on it, you should then see, I believe at the top right, that um, access is provided by the University of Kentucky. Right, so professional license. Again, um, if you want to actually make something in this, you're going to have to um, if you want to save it, you'll have to create an account. So if you're playing around with something that you want to, you think you may go back to later, then you'll have to create a, a, an account really quickly. I mean, it's pretty impressive though what you're able to do. Um, so you can see, right, it is a pretty widely used program. And so it primarily uh, functions off of census data. So this is, would be a good option if you're making something that A is going to be focusing on the US so it doesn't really provide international data. Um, you're kind of working within the realm of kind of census scale, so country, state, county, census track. Um, you're kind of situating your map in a larger story, a larger project, right? So this isn't something that's going to allow you to make a fully customizable map. You're sort of locked into the structure of Social Explorer. Um, but it then does allow you to share this online. So if you were thinking of kind of embedding this into something, theoretically, maybe like a libguide or something, you could probably play around with that. And I theoretically make that work. Um, so again, I think it's a nice entry point to sort of just getting comfortable kind of playing around with some of the web map mapping features. And then you can see that depending on the type of data you select, you can make a series of maps. So the kind of chloropleth or the thematic map, a size point bubble map or a dot density map. So has everyone kind of gotten to this page? Excellent. So if you wanted to select maps and then start now, it should open up the um, editing platform. And so it defaults to this um, set of data here with population density, but we can change that pretty quickly.
And so just as a quick overview of where stuff is located on the editing platform, you can see here at the top um, left, this is where you can select your different data. Um, the visualization type is where you select if it's going to be a shaded bubble or dot density. Um, and then you can edit your data here to the side. And then there's this kind of customizable annotate um, feature here at the top. And then you can also search for stuff. Um, but this is sort of the basic layout. So it's always tricky to have things up and then have other things have the editing platform up as well. So Okay. Oh, did you have computer issues? Oh, well, welcome to UK. Um, <laughs> okay. Is anyone else having that same issue that like stuff is not loading? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. So the first thing we want to do, right, is, is select the specific data. So you can see it's pretty expansive, right? It, it, it extends over time. And then you have a lot of different options for the type of data that you would like to display. So if we want to just sort of, as an example, we can select tra travel time to work. Um, and then you can see, right, you're given even more options for if you want to focus on specific commutes. Um, commutes where it factors people who work at home and people who don't work at home. So again, right, it's giving you a lot of options to kind of specify something that's productive for whatever your larger project is. Okay. So if we just select the workers 16 years and over who did not work at home, what you notice is it does not give you the option for a shaded area. So this is, I think, one of the kind of um, limitations in some ways of this program is that for um, certain data, it finds it too difficult to tether it to state lines. So it defaults to the bubble feature, but then that produces a map that basically is useless. Um, so this is the one thing that you do have to be cautious about as you explore that um, when it's dealing with exact numbers, it has a tendency, tendency to not allow you to use the shaded area. So then you kind of have to find alternatives or sort of think a little bit differently about your data. Uh, it should just default. Um, So the question was asking about um, the show data visualization type and it defaults to an automatic result. So it's trying to set up the data. So it, um, in its mind, is presenting it in the most effective way. But that's up for debate. So you can turn automatic off. And then you should have some different options then about how stuff presents itself. Right. So then this might be one way to kind of deal with the fact that it's defaulting to bubbles with this type of data, right, is if you sort of play around with how it's presenting itself. Okay. So let's go ahead and um, select, I don't know, who, does anyone in here have longer than a 40 minute commute? Does anyone have longer than 30 minutes? Okay. And so then what, 20 minutes? Is that maybe the average? Less? 15, 20. Okay. So 10 to 19 is maybe the average. 
So you can see that when I selected it to, to a more specific um, type, right, that kind of 10 to 19 minute commute, suddenly we can have it be shaded. So I think with this type of data, it looks better if it's shaded and is a chloroplath map rather than if it's the bubble type map. So you can see here at the top, right, this is the kind of default title it's giving you. So it's, it's showing you data for workers 16 years and over who did not work at home who have a 10 to 19 minute commute, um, which should be, it sounds like really relatively representative of everyone here in the room. And so then, right, you can begin to play around with even more customization features, right? This probably isn't good enough for whatever you're doing to show something like this. So, you know, one thing, right, would be perhaps you want to zoom in. So if we kind of zoom in over Lexington, we end up kind of over Fayette County. And what you'll notice is as you zoom in, the zoom number changes. So that um, is important if you want to set parameters for how well people can zoom. So this is something else when you're kind of working with the web maps, you probably don't want it to default to its uh, default zoom level because it's probably oftentimes going to be zoomed way far out. And so then you're going to have people just be confused, right? Of like, why is this defaulting to a global scale when the data is supposed to be representing something at like a county scale. So in the context of Social Explorer, the way that you can adjust the zoom level level is to consult the number here at the bottom. And then if you go to customize map, right? So if you click the little icon here and then customize map, you're presented with a series of options that are tabbed. So you have layers, base maps, and settings. And so this allows you to turn off certain features. So if you don't want um, city names, if you don't want state names, things like that can be adjusted under this box. But we want to go to settings. And then you can see zoom settings. So this is where you can set up restricted zoom levels. So similarly, if you're working at something that's at the US level, maybe you don't want people being able to zoom into the county level. So you can kind of adjust it so it effectively Depict, depicts your information. So for our purposes, we want to slide the little uh, bar so it is on, so that way we can actually adjust it and then move this. So it seemed like eight was maybe a good number. We can always change it later. Right, so then this is going to prevent someone from zooming all the way out so that they can see the US, but instead they're going to be relegated to more over Kentucky. Right, so then just as an example, if you go down to your zoom icons, if you try to zoom out, it's not letting you, right, because you've already maxed out how far you can zoom out. I realize you don't need to see all the things I've downloaded. Okay, so has everyone kind of gotten to this point as you kind of are exploring the different data? So one of the next things you probably want to do is to adjust the colors and then think about the breaks of how this data is represented. So this is again a really important feature when you're um, creating chloroplath maps is to think effectively about color usage. How does the color usage effectively convey your information? And then the data classification breaks is the, are the breaks effectively representing your information? So you can see if you hit the little icon here, you're given um, all the different breaks that it defaults to. You can then adjust the colors and then you can adjust the cut points, which is where the different um, breaks are for the data. So then just as a, right, so you can see we've kind of done this, right? We've, we've thought a little bit about the restricting the zoom levels. We've thought a little bit about the different um, visualization types. And then we can kind of think a little bit about the color button and the kind of cutoff points. Um, so one of the things you need to think about, right, is, is the data you're representing diverging or is it sequential, right? And that's going to be the initial choice you have to make about your, your colors. If you want them to, um, diverge from one another or if you want them to be a kind of progression from one another. So a kind of little handy trick is this website that is Color Brewer. So, 
So all this website is, is it's all about um, depicting color on chloroplast apps. It's not showing you unique data, it's just showing you, you can set up parameters for color, and then it gives you a visualization of, is, does that look good, does that look bad, should I change it? And so um, Cynthia Brewer is a pretty um, famous cartographer, so she kind of perfected this website. Um, and so you can see here, right, you can pick your number of data classes, you can then pick the nature of your data, and then you can start picking different um, color hues, right? Do you want them to be sequential? Do you want them to be diverging? Which colors effectively represent your information? Does it make sense for them to be shades of you know, purple to violet? Does that not quite mesh with what the data is representing? Do you want them to be something else? And also she has incorporated factors for kind of colorblind um, representations, right? So something to think about printer friendly and then photocopy safe. So again, depending on what your project is, depending on if you're incorporating it into um, a printed report, this website is really handy for not having that awful moment where you think you've made this beautiful map, you then print it, and it just doesn't look right because of different issues. Um, and then also, you can also incorporate um, the kind of color code. So if you have specific, if you, you know, are making a map that is about UK and you really want the specific UK blue, right, as one of the kind of color options, you can actually add that in and kind of see how it looks. Um, so, the, okay, so just as an example here, right, you can kind of move between these and begin thinking about, um, is it a large enough contrast? Is it connected enough? Is it divergent enough? Those types of factors. So if you are ever making a chloropleth map or a thematic map, I strongly recommend you kind of consult this website. It's, it's very handy, it's very straightforward, and it very quickly gives you a sense of if what you're making is um, going to be effective for whatever your end purpose is. So then if we migrate back, to our map here, right? This is not effective, right? The colors are not um, really different enough. I at least don't think that they are, right? They kind of blur into one another pretty quickly. And we also have a lot of different cut points, right? So if you select the cut point box, you can see, right, that it's kind of divided up in such a way that areas where there's no data are included, and that's probably not going to be effective, right? So we want to change that. So the classification method, right, can be adjusted. So folks with kind of a stats background, right, you're probably familiar with, with uh, this type of classification options. And so you then, right, kind of decide which one most effectively represents your data. Right, so you can kind of play around with it. The nice thing, right, with web maps is you can always go back if you realize what you did doesn't work. Um, so, right, you can kind of play around with it. This kind of, um, I think this was the natural breaks one, more effectively kind of shows um, the data with the same color palette. So again, right, this is just something that you can kind of play around with as you work with your data. So are there any questions up to this point? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, you just showed how you could switch that category with classification method mm -hmm. on that screen. Okay. Um. So, it probably becomes something that you need to do. And also, I have not been able to track the Okay, so how do I understand that? Because it seems like I'm not going to be able to 
yeah, that was just the one I went with. Yeah. So just to note that if you have been playing around and yours looks radically different from mine, one reason that could be is that you have um, multiple sets of data selected in the change data category. So you can leave it as is, right? Um, you'll have agency in this workshop, do what you want. But if you want to have it kind of look like mine, then you would need to deselect whatever extra data you've turned on. Okay. So let's say theoretically, right, this is kind of what we're going to um, be editing and kind of continuing to add unique information to. So if we continue to zoom in, let's kind of get in right over Fayette County. You can see that you have um, additional options. So you can add markers, you can add arrows, you can add images, um, you can label things. Um, so you can kind of play around with um, incorporating unique information into your map. Um, so again, you know, if you were working on a project, uh, perhaps with students that was thinking about the commute um, to UK, perhaps you would have them go take photos of different intersections or something, right? And then you could incorporate that into your map. So at this point, um, I think it might actually be good to spend just a few minutes kind of exploring the site at your own leisure, right? Hopefully I've given you a handful of tools that you can maneuver the website. Um, so much of this stuff, right, is kind of dependent upon your specific project. Um, so I want you to kind of be able to just kind of gain some familiarity with the program that hopefully you could then take with you outside of this workshop rather than kind of getting lost as I'm kind of going through a really regimented click this, click this, you know, click this. Um, so, you know, five or so minutes kind of just explore, see if there's certain data, right? There's a lot of different data that is available um, that you can kind of think a little bit about incorporating into a, a project. Right, you can travel through time with the data, right, if you want to look at stuff more historical. Um, and I'm happy to field questions as well as you kind of play around with it. Um, but yeah, so you can spend a few minutes just kind of exploring stuff here. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great, yeah. Um, recording has started back up again. Um, so one of the things I did as I jumped to a map I kind of made earlier, just to kind of show you guys a couple things. So one is um, adding photos. Right, so it looked like folks were successfully sort of doing color selection, kind of maneuvering around the page. But again, right, if you're sort of attempting to make something that um, is unique and ties in really specific to whatever your research questions are or whatever your presentation is about, you may find it productive to have images. So again, right, if you go up to the little icon here, there's this feature to annotate the, annotate the map. And then you're given all these different options, right? Um, so one of them is to add image. And so when you click on that, it's really um, straightforward. Like they've done a nice job of making this as kind of intuitive as anything can kind of be. So you literally just click wherever you want your photo to be. You then can title the photo. You can then upload the image itself. Um, you can rotate it. You can kind of change how opaque it is. Um, so it's very nice to kind of be able to incorporate photos. And the really lovely thing too is that you can adjust the zoom level. So this is really handy because that way if you're sort of showing folks specific data, you maybe don't want them to be able to see all these different photos until they zoom in super tight to a specific area, right? So then you can add that level of restriction. So um, people aren't kind of blindsided by why are there 20 images popping up when I'm at like the county level where, and all these images are tied very specifically to like local places. So as just an example of this, you can see, if I delete the little example here on my map, if I remember where the, uh, where it was placed, that's not going to show itself. Well, Nicholasville is a 
awful road anyway. So we'll go to the, the other option that I, oh, there it is, okay. Right, so you can see this is just, and I took this off of Google Street Image, um, but just as an example for the purposes of this class, right, this is kind of what it looks like when you actually have an image that you've embedded. Um, and then if I, right, zoom out, it disappears. And then when you zoom back in, it reappears. So again, this is the kind of um, live feature um, capabilities of web mapping, right, where you can kind of set things up to kind of come on and come off, depending on the criteria that you've entered into whatever platform you're using. And so then just another option, you know, um, if I find it slightly weird on the map that it kind of defaults to like the University of Kentucky in this area where I kind of think of the University of Kentucky kind of as more of this. So I sort of just drew kind of a freehand shape Again, that if you were sort of representing certain areas or regions on your map, you may want to start incorporating that type of um, polygon or kind of free shape into whatever you're doing. And so then you can edit it so it shows up on your legends. You can see down here that it's loosely illustrating that the gray blob is supposed to be the University of Kentucky. Um, so again, this is just some of the different features that you can play around with with something like this um, in, the, in the Social Explorer uh, program. Um, are there any questions about the photo stuff? No? Okay. So then let's say theoretically, right, you've produced the spiffy map um, and then you actually want to share it or export it. Um, you have some different features to do that. So exporting it is going to produce it as an image. Um, you can see that you're given options, so you can, it defaults to the, the current screen. So this, you know, requires you to zoom in and zoom out. This does kill, right, the live aspect of your map, right, because then suddenly you can't click and turn things on and off. Um, but it may work, right, depending on what your project is. Maybe you come into Social Explorer, you produce some really spiffy map that incorporates, incorporates different census data, and you're not interested or you don't need to kind of add more features than that. Um, you can also export it as a PowerPoint, which again, you can kind of select different size options. But let's say you've invested this time, you've added a bunch of photos, you then want to go to the share option, right? And so then you're given a link that you can share with anyone, they have all the kind of common um, different ways to share it via Facebook or um, Twitter or things like that. You can also open it up to collaboration. So if you are working with other people, you can add it so then they can edit certain things as well. And then you finally can email it or embed it um, into a pre-existing site. So kind of for the most part, right, you get a lot of capabilities. You're not um, going to be tediously attempting, um, or sh I guess I should say there's not a huge learning curve, right? You can kind of jump in and start playing around and, you know, within a few minutes kind of start having a template of a map that you can kind of continue to perfect. So are there any final questions about Social Explorer? Okay, so this is just again one option for how you can kind of produce web maps without having to spend um, a lot of time just learning how to code. So you can see that this is all stuff we've kind of talked about. Um, in the terms of kind of color, right, this is, um, I put these up here. So these are from Making Maps, a kind of really popular book by Krieger and Wood. And they do a nice job a little bit of sort of good map design versus bad map design. So this is something to kind of consult if you're thinking a little bit about kind of color options. So if you're doing stuff with kind of color hue, color value, color intensity, right? Until you start making chloropleth maps, you know, you kind of don't maybe think too much about those types of things. Um, so this is stuff that you can kind of refer back to. Right, and kind of one more slide of them kind of talking about, you know, kind of, you know, sort of what sort of conventions we have or that we sort of tie to color, right? So for example, you know, typically dark um, means more, 
So if you sort of have dark meaning less on your map, that might be um, confusing to people, right? And so, so much about maps, right, is how quickly people can look at it and read and effectively understand what you're attempting to communicate. So you should always kind of think carefully as you kind of pick colors, or even if you're working in black and white, think a little bit about if someone just glances at that map, is it effectively, um, can they easily understand what you're attempting to depict or is it going to be kind of uh, difficult for them to discern? Um, and right, and this is where you can then also get into how maps misrepresent, right? So you can sort of look online of all these different examples where bad map making produces misinformation, right? So there's this whole kind of a uh, connection back to sort of different color choices that can have good or kind of negative effects. Right, so we talked about that. And so then the kind of next sort of chunk of web mapping that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is what's called story mapping. Um, so some of you may be familiar with this, it's kind of gained in popularity. Um, and so this is sort of the process of kind of combining maps with kind of near narrative text, images, multimedia content, oftentimes to kind of tell like a linear narrative. Um, so if you were doing you know, I've seen examples of kind of like oral histories where you sort of then are producing these kind of story maps that weave the text or the interview material into the web map and then kind of shows perhaps the um, maneuvering of the person through space somehow, right? So the neighborhood they lived in and so here's the kind of corresponding photos and maps that kind of all augment one another. So this is perhaps a little bit more detailed in some ways than the kind of social explorer type map, but it can be really effective as well, right? So again, if you're kind of investing time in a bigger project, you might think a little bit about how can story maps effectively um, help you. And so there's different options. So ArcGIS has their own variety that it requires a paid subscription. Um, so you could speak to the UK um, ArcGIS licensing people to kind of see if they can kind of work with you to tap into maybe the enterprise subscription or something that they have. But if you're kind of just doing a like one-off project, maybe you don't want to invest the time kind of getting uh, or exploring that access. So I provided a couple free options. We're actually going to spend a little bit of time with Story Map. So. So this is a tool that's designed by Northwestern. Um, it's free, but it requires you to sync your Google account. So again, if you're uncomfortable with that, um, they do say that they're not accessing any information, but it basically functions as the repository. So if you upload photos and different things, it's going to be functioning through your Google Drive. So, you know, it's the give and take with free, right? Is yeah, certain privileges, um, it requires certain uh, uh, giving up certain privileges in other ways, perhaps. Um, so it most effectively, I think, produces a linear narrative. You can also have it produce a nonlinear narrative. And interestingly, you can incorporate Wikipedia, you can incorporate YouTube, tweets, photos, and you can kind of produce a sort of multifaceted visual experience for people. So just a kind of quick example that they provide on their website. So this was published in a uh, Minnesota publication. Don't enable. All right, so you can see that they kind of have the linear progression that you'll be moving through, and then you can just kind of follow the arrows and you can kind of read the text to understand um, the story, right? So it's pretty cool, right, that it kind of zooms in, it kind of jumps to a specific location. Again, you can see the inc incorporation of photo and text. And you can kind of make your way then through the, through the map. Um, right. And again, this doesn't require any kind of coding expertise. It's, it's pretty straightforward once you start playing around with it. I think it's almost reminiscent of making a PowerPoint in some ways. Um, so it's pretty easy. So if you guys um, can maneuver to Story Map um, Night Lab, if you, if you search for Story Map JS, it'll come up. Um, and your search should be ideally the first hit. Maps that tell stories. Okay. 
so you can explore other examples if you kind of just want, if you don't really want to um, at this point provide your Google information, that's fine. For folks that are willing to uh, share that information, you can go ahead and make a story map. And I believe the first thing that pops up is telling you you need to sync your Google account. It's apparently not compatible with Internet Explorer, but what is? All right. <laughs> I, know. I just don't understand why PowerPoint defaults to uh, opening in Internet Explorer. Okay. So after you select that you're okay with Google um, providing access to Google Drive, I think it gives you something that like looks like this and you can select new. Is that roughly accurate? Right, so if you're making something new, you need to give it a title. Um, you know, I thought we could just kind of explore a little bit with places you've lived or places you've traveled to to kind of maneuver around the map. But again, if you kind of want to play around in a, in a different um, sandbox, that's perfectly fine. So just go ahead and give it a title. Right, and so it should default to this um, editing box. Right, and you can see that mine, I've added stuff already, so it, it looks slightly different, but it should look something similar to this. Right, and it defaults to what they call your title slide, so this is the introduction to whatever your larger project is going to be. You can see here, you need to insert a title for your title page that will appear. Um, you can then insert text. Um, you can then insert different media, and so you can kind of play around with the different features. You also can change the um, base map. So if you go up to the options here at the top, top left, you can see that you can adjust the size, you can adjust the language, um, and then you have map type. So that's your base map. So again, depending on what you're trying to convey, you may decide that you want something that fits one or one of these options better, right? And they are kind of radically different. Um, so again, it just sort of depends. Um, Some of them are kind of more light, some of them are kind of darker. So you can kind of play around with which one most conveys. Oops. Okay. So you have your title page where you can provide an overview of the project, you know, if you're investigating, you know, um, restaurants or, or whatever. Um, as I said, my examples, sort of places I've lived, I have my eventual note to myself to insert a quote full of wisdom. Um, and you then can always switch to the preview option, right, that then shows you. So this is what the other page, when I select preview, that's what this would look like, right, if it was being presented to someone, right, so your title appears, whatever information, I didn't add any media, right, so if I added a photo or if I added a video, that would appear on this as well. So then you can always go back to the edit page. And so once you've um, completed your title page, you can then just add new slide, right, so it is kind of reminiscent of PowerPoint where you're adding a new slide, The slide I added, um, you can see if it wants to load for us, that what happens when you um, add slide is you're given the search box. So this is a really important feature so that way you can pinpoint where to put your next place mark. So you can eyeball it if you want, but you can also search and um, make sure you end up with, you know, something that makes sense. So if you wanted to do, you know, Lexington, you know, it's going to then put the mark on Lexington. Does that make sense to folks? And then you can see, right, in terms of adding the Wikipedia information, right, it's just the Wikipedia link itself, right, and it formats, it's pretty straightforward and kind of uh, formatting it to actually fit the page. 
So again, I mean, I thought it would be productive to let folks just spend some time exploring this at their leisure. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but it, uh, again, is probably most productive if you just kind of jump in rather than have me tediously attempt to kind of walk you through something like this. So you may want to pause. Awesome. Okay, so we're back recording. Um, so again, just um, you have options there then to share whatever you produce, right? And so that's one of the other nice features is that if you spend the time creating something, you can then share it if the screen doesn't disappear. Right, and again, you have a link um, that you can share with people. You have the ability to embed it as well. Um, so some nice options for whatever you produce if you're kind of working on um, a, a kind of journalistic story or something you can kind of embed it onto your blog or, or whatever um, and then right you can see again just as an overview when you go to the preview it shows you what you've done and how it would be viewed by someone right so you can kind of jump between the different points and again, you can kind of see how it's producing sort of this linear narrative, right, where you're sort of telling it, this is how I want to move through space. So are there any questions about this or concerns? Okay. So we have about a half hour left, so I sort of want to transition to kind of one final example. So this is, uh, we'll focus on Cardo. So this um, is kind of pushing us closer towards having to grapple with um, coding and kind of more complex uh, tools for actually kind of producing a map, um, but we can still do something in Cardo as a nice introduction. So this is, if you eventually kind of see yourself actually doing a lot of web mapping, um, hopefully this is a nice little taste of just a pretty popular platform. So Cardo has kind of gained in popularity. Um, it's free up to a point and then you have to purchase, so it's like a lot of programs. Um, and so you can see the kind of free everything you're doing is going to be public, like a lot of websites, right? If you're um, using the free option, then you don't have the ability to kind of keep your stuff private. So depending on what your project is, that may not make sense. And then you can eventually um, kind of upgrade to either a personal subscription or, you know, if you're kind of working um, in a kind of a collective business environment, maybe an enterprise subscription would make the most sense and you can um, contact them rega regarding the kind of specificity of that. So for folks that um, wanted to make the um, account with Cardo, sorry, there we go. You should then be able to log in um, if you haven't already. You can see something I was working on that kind of defaults, right? So sort of once you start making things, it's going to kind of default to that when you log back in. Um, but you have options here, right, with maps and then data sets. So has everyone maneuvered to this page that's going to kind of play around with it? Oh no, it's yeah, we can wait a second. And so the other thing too, right, is hopefully you saw the email I sent out to everyone that asked you to access the Google Drive. We'll be downloading one of the um, files there to then hopefully upload it into this, so. So 
So if you click on the map, um, maps at the top, right? You then will be taken to your home page for all the maps you've created. You then can select new map. And then you can add a data set. So if you transition over to a uh, connect data set, you can see that you have different options for how you want to transfer the data into Cardo. Um, I don't think it'll work with Google Drive just because I was using my UK Google Drive and it can be a little different than kind of the typical Google Drive. So you will want to go to the link that I provided. And then you just want to download the Lexington bars, like the geocoded one. So this, for folks that were at the first workshop, was, was one of the things we worked on, right, was kind of how do you geocode stuff. So this is geocoding for folks that weren't at that workshop is when you take street addresses, but you don't know the longitude and latitude. So then you go through a process of tying that address to the appropriate longitude and latitude. So that way it can be read by most um, GIS programs. So if you click to download, you should then just be able to go back to the Cardo box or the web page, and then you should just be able to drag the downloaded file over. Okay, is anyone attempting to do that? No. Yeah, did, did it work? Like if anyone actually is going through the tutorial, did it actually work then for you to? Maybe? Yes, excellent. Okay, so then you can see that once you've successfully uploaded that data, it, this box then lights up, right? So then you can connect data set. It then should take you to this map editing program. And you can see that it has read your data and placed markers on the, on the map for you. So then you're, you're working in the Cardo platform, right, to then produce a digital web map. Um, and you can see here that you have your base map, your base map la labels, and then the data that we just uploaded that we then can kind of tweak and kind of customize in different ways. So you, um, if you click the three little dots, right, you can see that you can rename, you can export it, you can edit it, you can then, um, also, you, you know, give your map a title rate. Right? Untitled map is probably not um, the most effective. So then you can play around with things, right, and begin kind of crafting a map. So, go. So if you just click on the data that we just uploaded, on the actual kind of title itself, you should see something that looks like this appear. And again, we can start kind of playing around with some of the customization. So one thing you can do if you go down to the fill, where it's kind of that orangish, yellowish color that it defaulted to, if you just click on it, you can then uh, adjust the color. And one thing you can do is that you can see here that it's solid and then by value. And so then you can select, um, if there's a category that was in your data that you want that to be the determining factor for the color. So for example, if we just select name, what it does, right, is because each of these bars have a different name, it creates a legend where each of those dots then are a different color that correspond to a different bar. So are there any questions to kind of getting to this point? Okay. You 
you also have the ability to recenter the map. So this is nice too, right? That depending on what your data is, sometimes the map can kind of get um, kind of disoriented. And so that little, uh, the four arrows pointing towards one another is a nice way for it to re-shift um, to a more centered position. And then if you go back, Again, right, we have the ability to share, right? And so you can click through that and actually make this kind of publicly available for people or you can share it with specific people. Um, it will be entered in the kind of larger Cardo database, right? So that's part of how it's not private. So again, depending on what your, your uh, data is, this may not be appropriate to use for free. Um, but really, if you're dealing with pretty sensitive data, then you probably want to begin with like a desktop GIS platform. Um, that's going to probably give you the most options to kind of make sure certain stuff from your data isn't perhaps um, unintentionally made available. So, or you need to be purchasing the different web mapping options. But if you're kind of trying to stay with free, then you probably want to take advantage of them. the uh, ArcGIS desktop option that you can get here at UK. So are there any questions about this stuff? I had anticipated more questions. <laughs> so. so this is just sort of an entry point with Cardo. There's a lot of other things you can do. Um, you can kind of uh, analyze the data if you start uploading multiple data sets in different ways and you can um, play around with their widgets feature that they have. Um, that is kind of tricky for us to do because we haven't really put much that much data into the map. Um, but again, this is sort of one of the more popular kind of uh, alternatives to ARC uh, platforms that exist. And so, right, there's different ways to make an effective web map. Um, this certainly isn't kind of a, a, the most um, complete uh, presentation for all the different things you can kind of do or all the different platforms. But, you know, as you begin navigating kind of web mapping, you know, cost is oftentimes going to be a pretty big factor. The kind of purpose of your map as well, right, so those kind of um, go hand in hand a little bit on what options you'll choose and then where it will be displayed, right? It depends a lot on if you're producing something that's then going to be printed into a poster or printed or produced in a PowerPoint versus something that's going to be hosted on a website. The types of data that's available and then the time you have, right? As always, you probably don't want to embark on a uh, really ambitious, I'm going to teach myself how to code in one week, uh, if you have hard deadlines for a project you're working on. Um, we have some time left over. Like I said, I, I had kind of anticipated some more questions. Um, I'm happy if you want to jump back to any of the three platforms um, and if you want to play around for a while and then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, this is hopefully an effective introduction to web mapping. Um, are there any, oh, okay. So thanks to everyone that came. I do want to note that the next um, workshop is on Thursday, April 27th, and it is um, it's called Preservation of Research Data, and Sarah Dor Dorfinghaus, yeah, she will um, be conducting that workshop. And if there aren't any final remarks, then we're going to go ahead and end the recording. Um,